similar to, uh, in a sense, a conversation. You cannot have rehearsed what you're going to say and then meet someone because you're not ready for the response that will alter everything you have as an answer. And that's very much like painting. You can have something on your mind to start, and very soon after you start, the painting has a life of its own, and you get, in a sense, in a conversational relationship, in an interactive relationship with the work. When I first started to study drawing when I was 14, by the time I was 16, I knew this was to be my life, and I've never changed my mind or even had reason to question that. I have tended to live in such a way that I could concentrate and that I could, in a sense, immerse myself in what I was doing. My accompanying activity was teaching. I feel I was fortunate by personal inclination to find teaching appropriate for me. And it was a way for me to get out of my studio. It was a way for me to do something that I really believe in very strongly, which has to do to participate in the continuity of art, on the ongoingness of art. I felt very much connected, indebted to the persons who had taught me. When I looked at work of artists, it's as if they were alive again with me. And so that sense of continuity was significant to me. And the environment also was something I needed and wanted. And that was that I could identify. My earliest studies were related. I worked with an artist who was involved in Paris in the 20s and the 30s, very conscious of the School of Paris, very conscious of the precursors to the School of Paris. I was an ambitious art student. So as an art student, I painted very elaborate things. And it looked like I could work out in the gym fairly well. But of course, it was as an art student. And then I stopped being an art student. I was out. And then I was out for five years. And there was still the question of, now, what about, well, what do you want to do? And every artist has that. Of all the possibilities, you have absolute freedom. What do you want to do? And I painted a little painting of a glass and an egg. And it was gray. This is the humblest painting I had painted to date because, you know, I want to look good at our school. I painted glass and an egg. Not a really complicated composition. But it was the first painting that I really felt I could identify with, you know? That I said, yeah, I really believe that's my glass, that's my egg. That's... And then after that, not really coming into a kind of raging ambition from that modesty, I became involved in these paintings. I was really fascinated by the work of Piero della Francesca. And what fascinated me was the loftiness of his painting. And what intrigued me formally was the quality of his bas-relief. That is, Piero's paintings are paintings of tactility. They really, you could say that you could experience a Piero in Braille. That is to say, if you gave it to a sculptor, a sculptor could carve a relief from a Piero. If you gave a sculptor a Rembrandt, he could not carve a relief because a Rembrandt is not a relief or a sculpture or tactile painting. In that respect, a Rembrandt is something that exists in volume, in space, in the air. It would not give the sculpture the exact intervals of the depressions, recessions, convexities, concavities that would make that relief work. So there was that, and it was terribly grand, and it had, as I say, a lofty quality, and of course I was already aware of uh, Moore, because he had, painted, he had made the shelter drawings, and I'd seen some photographs of some early sculptures of his, and I was really entranced with the tactility. You pick up a rock. They're good feelies, and they were really quite marvelous in that respect. I was also aware that Dali had painted some rocks, and they were like geological metaphysical jewels. And they were sparkling, and they had almost, uh, what can I say, continents within them. But they were, and they were theatrical in that sense. And my response to those rocks was that that was something else. That was not what I was interested in. And what I really did, this, these paintings are painted with a little palette knife. And they, I, would, I actually set up all these rocks. And then I took a little palette knife. And gradually, I would paint a little speck over a little speck over a little speck over a little speck, and I painted. Now, the reason I did that was the thing that fascinated me was the permeation of color. The rock, when you broke it open, was the same color all the way through. There are not that many things that are the same color all the way through, and that was a color integral to the form and integral to the substance, and that fascinated me. Something that you could not separate, not like cloth dye, not like the peel of a fruit, the one color that has the inside of another color, or the outside of a flower, the inside of another color, etc. 
I can't rationalize too much about how I arrange them. Obviously, I had some real interest in the idea of a formal realization of something. If you look through it, you'll find combinations of movement through it that link up or counter to, to circular movements, some alignments, an X between them, a loop. All those architectural circulations were interesting to me. But I was not interested in, in, the, in the sense of making them an exact facsimile of the appearance of a rock per se. If you know, all of the shadows are triangulations which really do not relate to the forms of the rock. There's also the want not to find a rock at the beach, not to find a rock in some, in a sense, incongruous situation that may conjure the dream, but really in some kind of anonymous place in which the linear alignment somehow were to reinforce some of the movements between them. At that time, I had no consciousness of any aspect of an associative implication of those rocks. They were rocks to me. And then I met a poet at that time. I didn't know him well. Spent a few evenings with him. He was a poet in San Francisco. And he said, we were, he had seen them. I'd shown them to him. I'd never shown them elsewhere. They were in my studio. And we were having a bite to eat. And he said, you know, those little sexual pains are really interesting. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I had painted those little paintings in a studio that had a rose garden outside. All the time I painted those rocks, they're so fixed on those rocks. And the rose garden was, you know, like a rose garden. I'd say, hey, that's a rose garden. You know. Well, when I came back, having that reaction, because it was a planted rose garden, it, in that sense, artificial, it just bloomed one day. There it was, all in full bloom. And it was striking to me. And I didn't know, have a reason for it, but I started to go out, and I had the feeling, these are ephemeral. In two weeks they're going to go, I'll have nothing to draw. So I started watercoloring and drawing, I'm drawing, and I had no idea that it would be a five-year trip. What happened is that I got involved in the recognition of the changing aspects of form and color within the life of the flower. I got involved in the cycle of life of the flower. I got involved in sequences of temporality and atmosphere. Should the bud be in the morning, noon, or night? It just went on endlessly. There were sequential images. And in this, the indication is here, this rose is in a white place. At one time I had in my, in my studio, I the photograph of that, the, there were tables. And there were on these tables bouquets of four years. There were some that had died five years ago, and there were some little buds that were just in their plot coming to, so to speak. And I painted this in relation to that sort of conglomeration of flowers. And one of the ideas here was that I didn't want to paint so much picture of flowers as a flower-like painting. And one of the things that I felt, not only the proliferation of the floral aspect, but one interest for me here was that all the negative intervals would also become bosses in flowers. And if you start to really try to, let's say, if this dark vase and that dark vase with their floral arrangement, then this shape between them is a white vase, etc. So it keeps repeating itself. It's a multiplication of it. And the idea was not a picture of flowers, but a flower-like painting. And then in contrast to that, this which is called, uh, I think, uh, what is it, dried flowers or dead flowers. These two are extensions, but there were some paintings in which I went through the sequences as well. And that ended after five years, that ended in a kind of dematerialization. Finally, I was just painting petals. And, uh, it was like the end of the line, and I, I sort of craved uh, something, again, more substantial, more tactile, and, but I did want to go right back to the rocks, and I started to go up on top of Mulholland. I was touched and moved by some aspect of the persistence of nature. Uh, Mulholland is not an image of abundance. This is a very arid terrain. But what really intrigued me was the aspect of uh, vertiginous slope, uh, a, a branching root, that earth eroding from under it, its insistence on staying there, that sense of persistence of life. And then I can look back now because I can see what I'm doing this year that relates to this painting, but at that time I didn't see it. But there was some idea about, they were also planing off parts of Mulholland. There was the beginning of the brutalization of the land, 
this the Titleist land fracture. And I was also fascinated by um, the ocean front and Big Sur and all of that. And I found initially that I would actually stand in the place and make a drawing of a particular vista. But that never seemed to bring the reality of my experience uh, as a convincing visual return to me uh, because it brought with it a kind of nostalgia, uh, a nostalgia that the way I was working at the drawing, I couldn't shed it from another time. And I began to realize that it was not a view that I was interested in, but a compilation that I was interested in. And then I began to see that I, what I was seeking, and I hope is still present in here, when I painted it, I was really excited that, yeah, yes, I could see it happening. And it was, in a sense, some small prophecy of some future involvement. And what I wanted in this painting in particular was some sense of the panorama, sense of the very grand and the very distant, the way one might be on the edge of something and look here down. And at the same time, be very proximate. So uh, if you were talking about a film, being with a long shot and a close-up at the same time. And so uh, I think something of its scale and something of the movements that work through it give one the sensation of the grandeur of distance. And then, of course, all the elements that screen the surface are projected forward and are quite psychologically proximate to you. So it was that kind of involvement. But this is related to that painting. Again, it's in a way, but it's more in a sense of, uh, what can I say, an accumulation of natural elements of twigs, bones, whatever, uh, rocks. I was very concerned with local color. I really wanted it to be the color of dirt. I wanted it to be as dry as the crackling branch. I had all that intention. And then, I guess, the idea of how the water, what, feeds the land? Because the land without the water we know is the desert. Yes? Tell us uh, what happened artistically to result in this complete change in the nature of color? Yes. The shift from local color to color invention. I certainly knew well that the Forbes had done this long before I was painting. So it wasn't that I was going to rediscover the wheel. But there was for me, there has to be, for each artist, the actual experience of whatever the transformations are. So what I'm saying about the color change was that I think I was moving from an involvement in trying to penetrate the aspect of the organic material quality of nature and, uh, and identify with those forces. And I think I was beginning to be more inside myself and starting to feel for coloration that might begin to express some states of mind or feelings that I had. And that were no longer dependent upon the descriptive associative reference of what we call local color. Local color is what the poem broke. I think I cannot escape when I look at this painting the idea of the sense of division between the two figures, the idea of a contrast of temperatures essentially in the passages of warmth here with a division of a great blue, essentially in a cooler palette here except for the aura uh, around the, quote, sun or light orbit. And uh, uh, following land fracture, I began to see there was something about male, female, land and sea, something about that they could be fused as a muse, maybe. That's a much later awareness. That's in that room, really, that I began to see that. But when I began to see it there, I began to see I'd already been involved with it here. And also I want to say that I really believe all artists are always working for their survival. You can't just work to complete the work. You're also conscious of how the work will bring the next work or opens up the possibility. It's awfully hard really to know whether you're coming or going. Really, only people who are very familiar with the uh, plant growth know that there's the bare root system. I mean, everything's dead on top and it's grown like hell underneath. Uh, we also know that uh, there's the time of the glorious explosion of the flowering, and we also know the withering is quick after that. Nothing stays. You don't hold on to anything. You can't stay anywhere. You can just keep, in the, if you hope, at the moment of its vibrancy, and the work takes you, you take it. And there's a lot of trial and er error a lot of trial and error. 
And I don't think you make your decisions in some discreet and objective and critical way. I think you follow your heart, so to speak, and the aspects of the works that somehow convince you of, the credi of their credibility in relation to the wholeness of your experience. Because in a way, you are really discovering the reality of yourself. And part of painting might be thought of as a process of confirming one's reality. And not just one's reality, reality, the world around you, the world within you. I remember reading Picasso said one time, you asked me to explain my paintings, how can I explain them when there's so much here in spite of me? <laughs> yeah. Well, there is that, there is that. And uh, so, uh, I don't know, I, I noticed that the association of the rock or the stone seems to be recurrent and constant in my work. I've thought about it. I've thought, uh, for instance, to go from the stone to the flower had to do with the aspects of the temporal aspects of transformation. That is, I thought the sea rocks really were land rocks initially, and it's a metaphor for how you get rounded out as you live your life. They're very slow changing. How long do they roll under sea? I can remember when I was in Rhodes seeing a uh, sculpture of a Venus. I was so struck with that, I thought, oh, this is the most marvelous thing. It was so liquid. And uh, I thought, in terms of a concept, Venus rising from the sea, here was a female form that really was sort of aqueous and liquid. And then I thought later of it, well, was that really the concept of the artist? Or was that because it tumbled around the water for 2,000 years? You know, either way, uh, it was quite acceptable to me. Uh, and I, I'm disquieted if I find that I'm doing something that is really quite familiar to me to do again. And one of the things that interested me in this painting I had to do with some aspects of more radical proportional relationships of something that was very drawn out and long, or something that was quite massive. And also, speaking of some things that were quite tactile or dense in material, and other things that imply the dimensionality but were transparent. And the other thing is that this is not consistent in terms of viewpoint at all. If you look at this thing, you could not see, you could never see these objects in this way unless you kept moving around the room because the point of view on one may be looking up, the point of view may be from the left or from the right, etc. So this is multiple in its viewpoint. And at the same time, I was wanting something that was architecturally or plastically or structurally quite locked in. And uh, about this painting, there are things that are beginning to, were beginning to be on my mind. Having talked to you about that large one and about balances and contrasts, I've been thinking about even perhaps a more um, radical contrast. For instance, this uh, sort of turquoise configuration, which has a kind of flowing and ascending, at least for me. You know, that I'm, you know the artist never really knows. It's at least for me, someone says, well, it uh, looks like it's going down to me. And I wouldn't say, <laughs> you're wrong. I mean, it, for me, it's ascending. Okay. And it has a certain animation and gesture, and it plays, in a sense, in front of a form, or is integrated within a form, which one, I think, experiences very much as a, if you want, silhouette or shape, and then within that has elements which are essentially relief elements. So you have this configurative shape of animated motion, you have the stasis of the form of, of the outside, and you have the relief with inside, and what I was thinking about, it was early in, in the painting, and somehow I was taken by that. And as it developed, I'm still not working with a ground plane. Uh, I say I'm still not because of the very distant time, it seemed to me that the, the idea of painting a ground plane, that logic of the ground plane was opposed to the condition of my painting, of the world of my painting. That is, it brought a gravitational logic, and it brought you to think that these forms really exist somewhere. And what I was seeking was an image that didn't refer to him, that, that there's an island and these sculptures are on that island. It was really, that it was a mental image that it was in that painting, okay? So that, and as I increased in my sort of counting, countering gravitational, say, cantilevering forms that could never be cantilevered, heavy things that are up on top of the pictures, you're going to hold that up. Uh, it isn't as if I have a strategy, I'm consciously doing that, but I had a sense that every time I explained it, a form could be architecturally explained, there was some aspect of tension that I didn't quite feel was there. And I found that as I, oh, well, this is a painting, anything could happen. 
You know, once you say you're in heaven, all the ground rules are changed. So, one of the issues here, looking back, I didn't know when I did it, but I see it as perhaps a value, is that the implication of this, quote, great head, is that it's weightful. It's reclining and it's weightful. And to that degree, I'm beginning to feel that I can counter to animate the ascendancy of that movement against something that... So, more and more, I'm beginning to feel that I'm drawn to the composite nature of my experience. And that I'm seeking, if you want, even in the formal element, a composite, which will have, or offer for me, formal values inseparable from empathy, association, emotion, recollection. You've been very patient with me. I've talked to you an awfully long time. And I thank you all for being here, and I'm pleased I was able to. Thank you.